All right, what is up, everyone? Here with Luke Broyles, one of my favorite people to watch on YouTube when it comes to all things Bitcoin. Thank you for coming, Luke. Happy to be here, Ted. Sorry, I um I was not prepared. I'm in a Starbucks right now, so if you hear a little noise, my apologies. But um, yeah, yep, happy and, to be here. And the reason Luke's not prepared is because I did not tell him we would be doing this. He thought it was just going to be like a little private consult, answering some of my questions. And I figured. But this well, is better. This is even better, right? Yeah. Why not? I'm going to ask you the same questions I would have asked you anyway. Okay. So these aren't going to be super beginner friendly questions, but that's all good. Um, so first things first, dude, like I said, I watch you on YouTube a lot and I've watched, I wouldn't say all your videos, but definitely at least 30% of your videos. And I've learned so much from them. I think you're really, really, uh, you go really in depth. Use a lot of cool analogies that I can wrap my head around. And you're so consistent with the content. It's incredible. I almost can't keep up though, because it's so frequent. I'm curious though, who did you or do you learn from when it comes to learning about Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, I think it really depends. Um, early on, definitely Sailor, uh, Michael Saylor, Len Alden, Alex Gladstein, uh, really helpful helping me understand the importance of it. Uh, Gladstein, probably particular of those. Um, Energy-wise, obviously, Saylor has probably helped me the most there. Um, Bonds, probably Dalio, Ray Dalio, who's not a big point or quote unquote, but uh, Dalio, definitely. Greg Foss, definitely. You know, a lot of other, uh, both Bitcoiners and non-Bitcoiners. Um, as far as tech wise, um, probably Adam back more than anyone um, or just reading like the early days, honestly, of like Hal and Satoshi and others. I mean, I, I think people often sleep on that, but like you just learn so much. You know, there's so much debate today. of Oh, trade offs this. What about that? But it's like you could just go back to 2010, <laughs> read the post and like they were having the same debate then. And there's like zero noise. Right. Because today you have to like filter through there's all these different sides of the debate and like, oh, well, who's got the financial incentive and blah, 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 blah. But it's like, if you just go back to the early days, read the debates then, it's like, like you know, none of them cared about the money, right? So um, so anyway, um, today we're learning about the tech, probably Adam Back, Andreessen, of course, um, you know, but then early days reading those posts was really great. Um, as far as the main people learning from now, Pretty much, I'm I'm hardcore in the multi-sig world, and so pretty much anyone that's in the multi-sig is who I'm focused on at this point. Cool. But obviously, it's not what most people are. Um, but yeah, so yeah. good variety, which I think is good of differing opinions too. What I noticed was interesting too, is, and I don't know if I found this in any other field of research I've done, but like, if I watch a video about Bitcoin from ten years ago, or I read an article that was written about Bitcoin ten years ago, it's as if it was written today. Like the it's just so fundamentally sound. Like there's it's just so rock solid. And like everything that was true about Bitcoin ten years ago, almost everything about it ten years ago is also true today. Obviously, some variances like Lightning Network and um, multi sig now becoming more popular. And then now, what is the thing that's called like time locking? Is that the new phrase for that? Yeah, it's not. Um, time locking really. We're not there yet. Um, people have done it, but uh, that, I think that'll be a big deal but that's many years away yeah but i mean that's what i'm saying like there's these little things that are like kind of on the fringe that are different from bitcoin versus 10 years ago but for the most part it's the exact same protocols being run it's pretty cool so uh thanks for sharing uh who you who you learned from i wrote down a couple names there um you mentioned a couple times log versus linear scale so if i draw my whiteboard is and this is time, and this is price. I don't know if I drew that properly. Maybe it's the opposite. Is it like that? No, it's supposed to be like that. Other way. I think it's like that, right? You're you're muted. Yeah. Are are you drawing the axis? Or are you drawing? Price? This is this is going to be time. And this yeah. is the price. Right. Okay. So yeah. Let's say this is hundred k Bitcoin. Okay. Uh, and let's say this is 2020 jeepers let's say this is 20 2030 let's say okay log versus linear correct me if i'm wrong but is log like that and then linear is like this 
Um, it, it could be. I mean, it, it's log and linear is the difference in the y-axis here we're looking at, right? So if you know, linear is one, two, three, in order in you know, right, orders of single digits, but log is in magnitudes of ten, right? So if you're not looking at oh. 10K, 20k, 30k, you're looking at 10k, 100k. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Oops, there's all the questions. I just I just leaked all the questions. Oops, so. Oh, uh -huh. Setting up now. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No. That that's the only difference. And so when you go to log, the volatility smooths out. That, gotcha. That's the only difference, right? So um, the candle, the, the candle length is different. Is that right? Uh. Yeah. I mean, it could be. You know, the log theoretically, it's at least ten times smaller, depending which order of magnitude you're. Gotcha. Looking. So that's the difference. Okay. Because when you said log versus linear, I wasn't quite sure what you meant by that. But yeah. Um, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can pull it up if you want me to get into that yeah. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Give me just a moment. Pull it up on the fly. I'm using Starbucks Wi-Fi here, so give me a break. So, <laughs> so and, and why why did you want to talk about this? Was there a specific thing you were trying to understand? Yeah, because I was at the beach the other day, and I was talking to some guy about Bitcoin. I was like, carrying the Bitcoin. He's like, no, it's too volatile for me. And in my head, I was thinking... Yeah it's only too volatile if you try and like time the market and try and like trade it. But if you're just Correct. holding, it doesn't matter how volatile it is as long as it goes up in the long run. Right. Yeah. I remember yeah. you talked log versus linear in that regard. So I was curious what that actually looks like. Yeah. This is what, this is what that looks like in just a second. Yeah. I pulled up here. Okay. Here we go. Share my screen. Sharing. Oh, well, that's funny. Okay. That's a funny picture. Yeah, oh. this other one. This other one's better to go. Yeah, so this is price chart since 2012, 2013. So on the left, you have BTC and USD from zero to 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 25,000. On the right, you have a different y axis from one, 10, 100, 1,000, up and up and up from there. So it's the same data, it's the same chart. It's just one line is on the left's y-axis, the other one's on the right y-axis. So the line that's quote that's higher, the one that's dotted, um, that's in log. So you can clearly see the big crash in 2011 uh, from, I think it was $32 back to $3. You can clearly see that um, over here to the left. And then, you know, you see it recovers, it rises up, you get bubble one here in 2013, the bubble number two, 2013, the new low in 2015 at like $300 or whatever. And then this chart set data, we're only looking after 2018 here, but you get the idea. And then comparing that to linear, it's basically like a straight line yeah. until 2017, then it rallies up. So point here being that, you know, people look at it in volatility, but they're always looking at linear, which is not useful because no matter when you're looking at it in linear, it's just always 100% of the time going to look like a straight line and then a rapid, bubble and crash in the last couple of years, right? I mean, you know, again, this chart's from 2018. If you look at the chart today in 2023, it's the same thing. But if you look on um, a long view, this is a little, this chart's a little fuzzy. Same idea, except now this is out to 2022. So four years later, I mean, you can see it's the same thing. If you look at it in linear, it looks like it's just all over the place and only recently exploded. But if you look at a log, you're like, oh, okay, it's going up orders of magnitude, you know, it goes up from a dollar to ten dollars and it crashes down. It goes then to a hundred dollars and it crashes down. Right. So I it, yeah, I mean it is really volatile. Like ultimately it neither of those charts is like different data. It's still the same volatility. It's just a matter of is your perspective yeah. in terms of hundreds or, or or ones like you know like right now as we're recording it's forty thousand a coin. You know, I mean is it going to 20,000? Maybe. Is it going to 60,000? Maybe. You know, right. in this order of magnitude between 10,000 and 100,000, anything's possible. But are we going back down to below 10,000? I don't think so. Right. You know, it's kind of like, it, I mean, you know, it, like, sure, it's volatile, but it's being volatile within this order of magnitude. As long as you have your brain set to this range, then, you know, who cares? Right. Um, at least I don't. So. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I, I like that perspective. It definitely, um, it definitely makes things feel less volatile because you're looking at it with a much longer time horizon, right? Yeah, as opposed to just oh, what's happening today? What's happening today? What's happening today? 
all over the freaking. Today we hit <clears throat> over 38k, and now we're already back under 37. So, like, and I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, no, no, just because it's so fast. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't even check price. You know, I mean, and I know people say that, and sometimes it comes across as like a meme, but I mean, it's true. It's like I don't really check. Typically, I hear about things like this. I'm either doing a call or something like. Luke, what'd you think about the rise or the crash today? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, um, and, and that's probably because I could be wrong, but you don't really do alts, right? No, I don't. I mean, I know people that do. I know Bitcoin Maxis that do. Um, I, you know, obviously those aren't Bitcoin Maxis too. But yeah, I, I don't. I don't particularly check. Um, you know, I mean. I'll hear about it. Like Solana recently was up like thirty percent a day or something. So like I hear about those. Um, I mean, but do you XRP, trade, do you trade No, no, I don't. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I've got I've got some alts here or there, but they're tiny dust, and I don't really care. And you know, some of them are stuck places, and you know, just small amounts that don't make sense transfer. But gotcha. yeah, I, yeah, my. My Bitcoin position is like you know thousands and thousands of times larger. So <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I would I would not buy any today if I was starting a row. Put it that way. Cool. Mm. I'm curious. You mentioned a couple times in your videos how like right now we're still measuring Bitcoin, even in this conversation. Like, oh, one Bitcoin is worth thirty eight thousand. At what point do you see us getting off that? Um, comparison that that measuring stick of the US dollar like what's it going to look like when we say like this car equals a third of a bitcoin yeah um i think actually probably you know all we're talking about is unit bias there i think probably the unit bias will change first won't be the dollar it'll be into sats like i think i think we'll start talking in terms of sats before we stop talking about in terms of dollars if that makes sense right already so, seen that already yeah seen that. yeah i mean pe people do i mean yeah they do but it's it's a very small community you know i mean yes there are a lot of people that talk in terms of sats but that's dwarfed by the people that are still talking percentages of the whole coin and that's dwarfed by the people that aren't into this space that only view it as a whole coin right so you know it's like one percent of the tiny 10% of people even aware of this thing, right? Uh, so, I mean, yeah, but I, I think it'll be very common for people to talk in terms of SAT before they talk in terms of dollars. I mean, when it's a million dollars, when it's a million dollars a coin, that's uh, what, a, a, a cent of SAT, right? I mean, people won't be able to get their minds around it when it's a million dollars a coin, but they will be able to get their minds around a cent of SAT, right? I mean, like, I, I think, so anyway, I, yeah, I, I have no idea. I mean, Maybe we go decades without people changing their unit bias up from the dollar, which I know, you know, to some people might sound long, some people might sound short. I think the most Bitcoiners sound long, but I mean, you know, we're in 2023 and people still use snail mail. People still send checks. Yeah. I mean, you know, people, I mean, it's people are slow to change. And maybe people continue to have that mindset and pricing in dollars for a long time. But despite that, you know, they, they're pricing sats, right? It'll be a, a cent, a cent, and then it'll be, you know, two cents or, or, or two sats a cent, or, you know, I don't know. But yeah, it, it'll, I, 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 I guess the only answer is that it'll take as long as people's psychology takes to change, you know, and technology is changing faster and faster, but I don't know if our minds will change that fast. Yeah, it's interesting. Like when you look at the timeline of currencies throughout the world, it's like, this is a very we've we've only been off the gold standard for what 50 years 55 years ish right yeah but, uh, yeah 50 52 almost 50 50. so prior to that so in 1970 things were still like based on gold prices right in ounces or like one dollar would get you some, a certain amount of gold. yeah uh, yeah a certain amount yeah so gold was still like the Peg. The peg, exactly. And prior to there being notes, it was just straight up gold coins and silver coins, right? It, well, yeah, I mean, before the dollar, there were different forms of notes. I mean, you had continentals, you had, you know, different fiat currencies, but I mean, ultimately the idea we looked at, they're always backed with the coins. 
I mean, right. people, I mean, people sometimes use going way back in the day, but I mean, after the Dutch basically invented central banking, pretty much everyone used paper. Yeah. At least, when was that? When was that? What year? Uh, 1600s? 1600s. Something like that. Height of Amsterdam, whenever that was, mid late 1600s. If I'm getting my year right. So we've, been right. Using, we've been using paper money then for about, what, 400 years? Uh, predominantly, yeah. I mean, the Chinese were using it up to a thousand years ago, or you know, debatably more. I mean, you know, it depends, right? Because it's like, okay, is this paper money? Is that paper? So, you know, it's the farther back you get, the fuzzier the definition is, and the uh -huh. timeline gets longer. But yeah, I mean, central banking was kind of modern central banking was born about 400 years ago. You could say that. Yeah. And so ever since then, you know, we've been for 400 years using paper money, but again, that was prior to the internet. That was prior to all this lightning yeah. technology we have now. And even like the internet really has only been around for about 30 years ish, you know, been in mainstream use for about 30 years ish. Right. And it's like, that's where everyone yeah. is now. And there has been no money designed for the internet yet. And so Bitcoin just, it just fits that, the need so perfectly. And so I, 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 I'm yeah. curious how you see this, but like I walk around sometimes, dude, I don't have Wi-Fi, So it's like, I can't use my Bitcoin wallet. I can't use my Bitcoin credit card on my phone. So I have to have these paper, you know, fiat notes. Yeah. Um, so do you still see there being a lot of paper use in the future? Yeah, I, I I think there could be, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty hardcore bullish person. Anyone that watches my videos, you know that, but I mean, I, I think, I think people radically underestimate how dramatic uh, Bitcoin would take over. And I think they radically overestimate the decline of the dollar, right? Like, I don't think, well, I, I was just telling you before we started recording, I just went filmed a video for this and it was about hyperinflation of US dollar. And I, I mean, on one hand, could it happen anytime? Sure. But on the other hand, I, I think it'll take a long time. You know, there's at least 100 currencies to die before it. So my, my, I guess my point being that I could easily see maybe even at like 30, 40, 50 years, most people are using SATs, you know, because at that point we'll be talking in terms of SATs. Um, you know, most people are using that, most people are saving that, but they'll still, you know, still use dollar. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe not, but I mean, it's not based on reason. It's like it's it's unreasonable. So as long as people are willing to be unreasonable, it will survive, right? And there may be many parts of the world where they don't have internet access or it's not reliable, and so they still use dollars, but they just save in Bitcoin, right? I mean, you know, in the same way, right? And I think I think I think the other funny thing too is that like perhaps even grows, right? You know, like this is a recent friend of mine. What if you know if the globe is this size? And it's like 99.5% dollar slash fiat and ten, tiny slivers Bitcoin. Like maybe in the future, it expands and now it's 80% of everything and fiat's only 20% of the world. But if that whole pie, you know, like it's a larger and larger slice of the pie, but if the whole pie grows, like maybe we could even see the dollar systems grow in the amount of energy it channels but because it's a smaller and smaller influence as a share of the world you know it, it's still dying but it's still surviving right so like I, I think i think it's entirely possible we'll still use dollars for decades more i mean again internet we're, we're biased and we think the internet is taking over everything we're doing this call on the internet people listening to this on the internet but a lot of people you know about half the world still doesn't use the internet and probably another quarter of the world beyond that doesn't use the internet very frequently. So, I mean, you know, if like we're this far into the internet and it's still this early into the internet that perhaps two thirds of the world are not really using it to its full potential. Like, I think it could be the same thing with Bitcoin, right? Like, what if in 30 years it's tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions, or tens of billions of dollars of coin just because the dollar is falling so much and because it's growing in value so much? Uh, Bitcoin's growing value so much, you know, and we're still using dollars. Like, I don't think, I don't think it's going to be an overnight cliff. Oh, we just don't use dollars anymore. I think it's going to be very long, and just because it's going to be very long, though, does not mean 
that one should dilly dally learning about it, right? I mean, yeah, it was still early for the internet, but Blockbuster's gone, Kodak is gone, Sears is gone. I mean, right? So, it, it, so I, I think it's that tension that it'll take an extremely long time, but it'll be far more change than we expect, and therefore it's still urgent. So. Well, we're seeing it already, like ever so slowly, these bank failures, right? Like, oh, this bank failed, and this bank failed, and maybe it's just a matter of like all these banks slowly failing over time, but. Yeah, no, there's... Well, yeah, it, it, and I, I think an interesting thought is what if what if the banks fail and those people still haven't adopted Bitcoin, right? Like like I said, Sears, Kodak, you know, all, all the pre-internet companies that failed to adapt to the internet, what if they all, you know, they all failed when the internet was at, you know, 10 to 20% adoption? Like, we don't have to have 80% Bitcoin adoption for big banks to go under. Like, maybe we're only at like 8% or 5% or 10% adoption and we start to see these banks go under, right? I mean... Interesting to think about, that's for sure. Elon Elon posted this recently. He's like, I'd be surprised if in five years people are still using banks. Elon said that? Yeah, because he wants X to be like the place where people go and pay and everything and hold their money. and Yeah. Like, you know, well, I, it's a bank no. when you come out. In fact, I, I have a dude, I just launched my company in Dubai and I needed a bank account. And I can't tell you how freaking hard it is to get a bank account there, like physical banks. So I just opened up this new bank. It's like this app. It's called Wio, W-I-O. And it's this app-based bank. And the whole bank is on an app. And like they say, we don't have a headquarters. Like just hit us up on the app if you need help. We got your money. So it's like I opened up with Dembro in like five minutes. And now I, I go through Wio for everything. I can't stand the brick and mortar banks. They're so slow. So maybe, yeah, Elon's right. Like maybe there won't be brick and mortar banks anymore. It'll all be app-based banks. Yeah, like, I mean, you know, we can think of Bitcoin as the technology to eat them, but maybe even within the banking sector, there's going to be like another whole cycle. Like maybe brick and mortar goes down and e-banks, kind of yeah. like what you're saying, take over. And then eventually Bitcoin takes over the e-banks. Like well, yeah, because now with the e-banks, I'm sure in the future, like they could be like, oh, why, not, why just deposit your USD? Why not send your Bitcoin here as well? Like we'll be your wallet as well, right? And then banks start becoming wallets. Yeah, yeah, very possible, you know, and I, I say this a lot too, but, you know, the longer I'm in the space, the earlier I realize it is, I think a lot of people feel that way too, but it's like, you know, I look at lightning, I look at layer two stuff, you know, because starting out, I was like, oh, wow, it's so advanced, it's got so much in price, I must be late, and now I'm like looking at layer two stuff, I'm like, you know, holy cow, this is archaic, this is ancient, obviously it's great, obviously lightning's amazing, but it's nowhere what, near what we need. And so just thinking about that, like, wow, this is already so much better than so much competition. And it's so early and it's still not there. It's, it's, yeah, it's very, very exciting. You're part of the younger generation that's getting into it. It's clicking faster for you. I'm 33. I think you're what, 24, 25? Yeah, I think actually it clicks with your age group more than mine, but yeah. Well, yeah, but you, you, you're like that younger generation that's getting it, like, a lot earlier than us. Like it took me till 33 years old to get it. You're getting it 24. There might be some 16 year olds now who are, it's getting, they're getting it, like it's making sense to them. And so- yeah, I, I don't know, I don't know if I agree with that. I think, I think people your age understand it much more than people my age. But maybe, maybe because we've been studying it for so many years and like people your age are just like on TikTok or whatever and they're yeah. really studying it. Yeah, p people my age, you know, most people don't start saving at all until they're in their late 20s or early 30s, right? So the fact that anyone in their young 20s is saving is a big milestone. But then for them to go down the rabbit hole and figure this out is even harder to do right then. So, you know, so I, I it'll, think be, it'll, it'll be like me and you, like our generation, if and when we have kids, our kids will then be brought up and Bitcoin will be so obvious, right? Because like the yeah. whole thing yeah, will be I saving think. in Bitcoin is all we, you know, do. So... That next generation will be the one to it, it'll be born into it. Yep, I think so. Born into Bitcoin. Um, well, and, and and the funny thing is, like that's probably the most people will be right. You know, like even if we keep up, you know, just at current birth rates, and I know birth rates are declining and all that. I I, I think and hope it goes back up in a couple decades or maybe sooner. But it's like even if we just even if the world only survives another couple hundred years or hundred years at today's population at current birth rates, the majority of people 
will be born into a Bitcoin era, right? So like in a hundred years, like most people just be born into us, into this, and it'll be normal. And they'll wonder why we didn't realize it was inevitable, right? Like in the same way, like the majority of people in history have been born after the computer, right? Like like more people have been born in the computer era than before the computer era, right? I mean, you know, or perhaps that's not quite true. Perhaps it's the automotive or, you know, whatever it is, it's like, you know, it, it, to us, it seems weird that the automotive was never normal, right? I think it'll be the same thing here. Like in just a few generations, it'll be so normal. People wonder what it was like without it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of 100 years from now, miners, how are they going to be incentivized to mine if there's no more Bitcoin to mine? I mean, sorry, how are they going to be incentivized to like secure transactions if there's no more Bitcoin to mine? Uh, well, transaction fees, you know, theoretically, it's a huge debate. A lot of people say it's unsustainable. Um, I am much more in the camp. I think the free market will figure it out. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of debate there. Like, will they having that's the video I posted today? Will they having have an impact? You know, there's a lot of reason to think, oh, the having will have a diminishing impact because even though it's a supply cut by half, it's a perpetually smaller um, share of the total coin base, total block of war or whatever. And so, you know, maybe it does have a diminishing impact, but maybe it doesn't, you know, at least for a long period of time, because if price meets equilibrium and then incoming supply has, I mean, that's going to have an impact, right? Like, I, I think... I think it will have a noticeable sort of impact for a very long period of time. But yeah, eventually, theoretically, it's just um, transaction fees that subsidize everything. Well, are transaction fees incredibly low? So they have to like process a crap load of tra I guess by then, more transactions will occur. So if a transaction fee is like $1.50, then they mine like, you know, a thousand of those a day. Yeah, get... yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it was part of the design, you know, part of the genius was that, you know, you have to have, you have to have both. You can't issue all the coins at once, um, right? Because then you get centralization problems. So you have to have some sort of distribution. And, you know, they, you know, Satoshi figured it out that, and it seems to be working, right? You know, I mean, it probably could have worked other ways too, but now looking back, it seems hard to have seen it working other ways. It probably could have worked other ways too, um, you know, like maybe if you had done six year havings instead of four year havings or different blocks, or I mean, you know, like perhaps it could have worked, um, but I mean, that's not what he chose. He chose this and thus far it's worked, you know? So, I mean, yeah, to your point about, here, I'll, I'll pull this up if you don't mind. I don't know if yeah, you like this, but yeah. So this is, this, this is the mempool. This is the first transaction. Uh, 15 years ago, block 170, Hal Finney's transaction here. Uh, 40 coins, or or no, you know, 50 coins. Um, uh, you know, between Satoshi and Hal, this is right around the time he had that tweet. You know, um, but anyway, you know, point being that 15 years ago, you know, literally one transaction. You know, all these blocks only have one transaction because that's the 50 coin, um, coin base, right? Like why? That, that's the, Sorry. Well, why is one seventy the first block? Why not block number one? The, the first block with the with the transaction. So what happened to block one six nine? To to block one sixty nine. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. That it was nothing. It was just it was just Satoshi running the network. There was literally nobody oh, yeah. using it. And he was oh, so it was, it was sending him to himself or? Oh yeah, I mean he was the only one you know supporting the network. Uh, you know, so he got those coins. I mean, you know, that's worth 50 guys million coins, right? Um, you know, so this is 50 coins. So all my point being that all these transactions, or excuse me, all these blocks have literally zero transactions peer to peer. This one was the first one with that between Hal and Satoshi, you know. So this is 15 years ago. If you want to jump forward, let's say 300,000 blocks. Uh, now we're looking at 10 years ago. Now there's 200 transactions, 200 here. Uh, 89 transactions over here, 500 over here. So, oh, you know, I see. So, so what you're saying is, fast forward in the future, there's going to be probably a thousand transactions per block. Yeah, I mean, if, if you go to today, I think there's five, six, <coughs> yeah, yeah. So here, last block at time of recording, 30 minutes ago, 
there were 5,000, 900, 1,600. So my point being that, you know, the network usage is growing exponentially. So, I mean, as that occurs, as we assume that occurs, I mean, eventually the fees will just be so high that, you know, the number of transactions can't go up indefinitely unless we were to increase block size, but the um, stat per byte would increase forever. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if we give it 100 years, it should be easily enough to, to cover that, right? And that's the that's trend that's been happening so far is that transaction fees as a percentage of the block to board has been going up for, you know, a decade plus now. Granted, you know, it's gone from 0 0.0000, you know, 0, 0.000, Right. So we look at that again on a linear scale. We say, oh, it will never reach 100 percent. But if you look at a log scale, it's like at least to me, it's like, yeah, no problems. So anyway. Yeah, that's really interesting. Rather than going to mining Bitcoin, they're just securing transactions. Gone will yeah. be the days. Yeah. Gone will be the days of the. As you made a state, you made a video about this called like a. Uh, the land rush. The land rush will be over. Yeah, it's like the Homestead Act, right? I'm, I'm not the first one to use that metaphor. You know, um, Jesse Myers, Sailor, and others have used similar metaphors, but it's like the same idea, right? I think, like, this is the land rush between 2009 and 2140. So and we're very early land rush. Yeah, we're very early land rush. And you and I, no offense to you or myself, we are probably not the smartest people in the world. No. But so why, my question is now is why are there so many billionaires who, some of them might be smarter than us, why aren't they just buying up all the Bitcoin? I think there's a lot of factors there, you know, and I don't think intelligence is the only factor. I think intelligence is a huge factor. Um, I think open-mindedness is a huge factor. I think vision is a huge factor. I think your bias is a huge factor. You know, there are a lot of very, very smart people that don't get it because their bias blinds them or because they don't have vision. You know, I mean, look at Charlie Munger, right? Yeah. You know, he, he's, he's got a disadvantage because he's old and it's a fact that old people have difficulty learning new things. That's just because their brain is slower. They've been, it's been trained for 50, 80 years a yeah. certain way. Um, you know, so I think there are certain hindrances like that, perhaps age, perhaps lack of education, lack of resources. Um, you know, I mean, but yeah, there are lots of not smart, quote unquote, people, or let's just say average, that get this very well. And there are lots of smart people that get it, and lots of smart people that don't get it, you know. And I think, yeah, I, 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 I think, I mean, I mean, if we just think of money in general, I think that's true. Like, there are a lot of really smart people that are super rich, and there's a lot of really dumb people that are super rich and be willing to admit that they're not super smart, right? You know, I think. Being right place, right time has a lot of impact. I think the right tenacity has a lot of impact. Um, you know, I mean, I think there are a lot of super smart people that are perhaps too smart for their own good, right? I mean, I, I think, I, I think my, I guess my answer there, hidden in not rambling, is just that I think there's many, many factors. I think intelligence is only one component of those factors, right? Like, like for me, making all this content, like I'm doing really well making this content, you know, it, it's starting to pick up, it's been going really fast. I am shocked by it, especially with the beginning, because I do not think I'm the smartest person in in Bitcoin. Like, I can't code. I, I hate coding. I've, I've tried it before. I hate it. I don't like it. You know, I'm not, quote, unquote, building anything there. I'm building stuff elsewhere. You know, I, I'm not a core dev. I'll, I don't think I'll ever be a core dev or even think about thinking about trying to be a core dev. You know, so it's like, I thought, who want to listen to me? But it like it's it's between my energy and my ability to tell a story and trying to relate to people where they are, I think, among other things. But you know, there are lots of people out there, probably smarter than me, definitely richer than me, that have other benefits over me, that could be doing as much, if not more, content better than me out there, more profitably than me, because I don't make any money doing this really. Um, you know, and they don't either because they don't put in the work or because they don't have the vision or because they're distracted with a different idea they have, or because they are super brilliant genius, but they can't tell a story, you know? So I don't think, I don't think intelligence is the only factor when determining success in anything, especially understanding this. Yeah, a lot of good points. A lot of good points. You, you just think like, wow, if Sailor, 
is like one of the biggest whales out there. He's only one of them, right? It's like you can't, I can't even count all the sailors on one hand. I mean, I can, there's only one. Michael's fucking there's one. There's no second best. There's Michael Saylor. Um, but there's like, you, you'd think that there would be like dozens of sailors out there, right? And maybe 10 years from now, there will be. 15, 20 years from now, there will be dozens of sailors out there. Um, yeah, probably. I mean, I, I think I think part of it, like I think with sailors, for example, like I think intelligence is a huge part of it for him. But there's other factors too. Like sailor, you know, I mean, how many people can you refer to them by just by the last name, right? Like, oh, sailor, right? Yeah. Nobody calls me broils. They call me Luke. Royals, right? You know, so to get to that like legendary status of like sailor, right? It's like, it's not he's not there just because he's smart, right? He's there because he's smart, but also because he's eloquent, right? If he can't, if he couldn't go on these shows and these podcasts and talk like he does, and he's just this rich guy buying it, a lot less people would care, right? He's one of the longest serving CEOs, if not the longest tenured one on Wall Street. That's a huge factor. Um, you know, he, he had a company that was the perfect size in order to do this. If MicroStrategy was any smaller, he wouldn't have been able to buy as much as he could have because it's not publicly listed or whatever. Yeah. And if it was any larger, he would not have had, you know, control like he does and he wouldn't be able to do it. Right. Like Tim Cook has far more influence than Sailor does, but Apple's a far larger company that, you know, they, he can't do it. So part of it is that he's very fortunate he's in the right size company. Um, part of it was that it was right timing, late 2020. He got excellent interest rates. Uh, so, so yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, like, so I, yeah. 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 I, 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 interest. Yeah. So, so I guess all I have to say is that, you know, Sailor's like the perfect combination of being ready for the right time. And executing on that, some people will call it luck. I don't think it's luck. Um, I mean, it is, but it isn't. And so, I, I guess all I have to say is that I think people will look back at us and say, "Oh, we were just brilliant," or "Oh, we were just lucky." And I don't think that's you know, there are a lot of people a lot luckier than us that didn't take advantage, and there are people a lot smarter than us that didn't take advantage. But I think yeah. there's just a huge number, and we are just happy to be fortunate that we're here. Like even me on a microcosm, it's like. I happen to be in America. Like, that's a huge factor, by the way. You know, 95% of the world is not in America. So, like, I happen to be in the right country, born in the right time, with the right interest in history, with enough perseverance and obsession to figure it out. That happens to be at least smart enough to get it, get over the bare minimum there. That happens to be a good storyteller at a time in, in the cycles where people really wanted to hear a new message. I mean, it, it worked out very well for me. And I think yeah. Sailor's the same way. I think you're probably the same way. I think probably anyone in the space at this time is just extreme far left end of the bell curve. No, it's true. There's so many factors that go into it. So many different factors that go into us, not just being in it, but staying in it, right? Like how many people got into Bitcoin and then got out when it crashed and they're never coming back because they're afraid. Or, or they will, but in eight years. Yeah, sure, they will. Like, like I, I know a lot of people... I would say probably ranking about the same on the luck and intelligence spectrum, but just lost interest, you know, and moved on and they'll come back, but in another cycle or two cycles. I can't and imagine like the, to me, the reason I, I don't go back to the reason I don't think I could ever drop Bitcoin and like stop thinking about it for more than a freaking day is because like the alternative money is garbage. Fiat is garbage. Cash is trash. Like it's just, in terms of like where it comes from and how it loses value, right? Like, yeah, but they don't realize that. That's what they oh, don't realize. Exactly. But like inflation is like, it's, I didn't really wake up to inflation until like this year when I started doing the math on it. I was like, let's just say it's 7% a year. Over the span of three years, that's a 21% drop in my purchasing power. Well, it's worse than that, right? Well, it is because worse than that. I'm saying minimum, like minimum 7%. It's far worse than that. But, 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 even, but even at 7%, which is like, you know, it's not much higher, but let's just say it is 7%. Over three years, it's 21%. Over six years, that's 40% of your purchasing power gone. Like, I don't want that, man. And so my only alternative is Bitcoin. Yeah, but it's too volatile. Yeah. See, that, that, that's getting to your volatility point earlier. That's the funny part. Right now, volatility is viewed as a bad thing, but in coming years, it'll probably be viewed as a good thing. You don't want an asset it's not volatile when your currency is becoming volatile. You want the volatility, right? So it can adjust 
to the upside, right? That's the downside of real estate. That's the downside of bonds. That's the downside of, you know, things that are not liquid. Is yeah. that they're not as volatile, right? You want your, you know, if it's it's what we see in other examples around the world, right? You don't want you don't want volatility typically because no one likes volatility. But when you don't have a choice, and you have to choose volatility. Then you want the most volatile thing. That's a good video for you to make. Benefits of Bitcoin volatility. Yeah, yeah, it would be. <laughs> there, there, there's a long list of things to make before that, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a question. So Bitcoin, I can wrap my head around why the price goes up because it's finite, aka scarce, and people want it. So to me, that's just a matter of time before price goes up. That Those are the only two factors I need to know. It's finite and people want it, right? And they're going to keep wanting it. That's all I need to know. So to me, I can wrap my head around why the price goes up. I can't wrap my head around yet. Maybe you can help me. Why the price of things like Ethereum go up when the coins aren't even finite. Like they can just keep printing more Ethereum. Why is the price going up? You know, people, people like to throw hate on Ethereum and I get it. But truth be told is that it's far more scarce than the majority of fiat currencies. You know, granted, it's probably far more likely to be penetrated and change but you know it's like what's equity what, inflation rates like what one percent right now i mean that's still very attractive compared to everything else even though it's not sound money even though that monetary policy can easily change the future i'm not saying it's not going to it'll you know probably change many more times in the future and it's not good for their network but i mean you know it's like it's the same reason people are still buying bonds it's the same reason people are still buying gold even though all those things are inferior there's still a lot more scarce, you know, silver is a great example, you know, I mean, silver, it, like, it doesn't really go up in price, but at least it doesn't go down, you know, and it's because, yeah, silver's garbage and saving your long-term purchasing power in view of gold, in view of Bitcoin, but it's still better than the alternate. So, yeah, I think, and I think a lot of it too, you have to keep in mind with the altcoins is that another thing that separates them in a large way from Bitcoin is that their pre-mines are massive, right? Ethereum has a 70% pre-mine. So a lot of that market cap, you know, I don't know if it's off my head, but I'm sure very large percentages of, you know, the top alts, and then even larger percentages of the smaller alts, um, a lot of that market cap is just locked up in that ICO or the three point offerings, right? Versus Bitcoin is that since it's all been distributed via mining, you put the work, that means it's all had to been realized at some point, right? So, you know, your liquid price or the average exchange price, you know, can be very different, right? But, but yeah, I mean, you know, with, with the alts, yeah, they, they simply have value because people believe that they are going to be worth more in the future. And probably some of that's justified if people actually build stuff on them that's valuable, much more, more than what they're building today. But ultimately, they can't be money. Because even if they increase in value, and actually, I actually I, I think they'll do pretty well. You know, next cycle, like I think people will just keep buying them. You know, the problem is that you don't you don't know when. There's no logic to it. Um, you don't know when it's going to go up, when it's going to go down, and you don't know when a nation state is going to print into Bitcoin. You know, a nation state's not going to print into Shiba Inu. A nation state's not going to print into Ethereum because they can't control Ethereum, right? It's like if you're gonna in, if you're going to directly harm your own currency by printing it in order to acquire a share in a different network, you better make sure either number one, you have control of that new network, or number two, that it's Bitcoin and it's completely neutral to where nobody else can take a share in it, right? So, you know, if, if a nation state was like, oh, yeah, we're going to print money and buy ETH tokens, I don't really see the point in that because then if they do that, then they just take over ETH, ETH becomes an arm of the state. And, you know, okay, so, like, why would they use that? Why wouldn't they just have their own CBDC, right? If, if that's their goal, you know? So, I mean, p point being that I think alts will outperform Bitcoin for periods of time, and I think they won't. I think over multiple cycles, they won't. And I think if and when nation states start printing to acquire Satoshis, then I think then I think the trading pair between those alts and Bitcoin just plummets. True. Cool. True. A, so, a lot of that's timing again, right? You know, we happen to be in this, you know, the internet, there were multiple internets, 
before everyone just now uses TCP IP. I think it's the same thing today. Like people will look back and be like, oh, there were different versions of Bitcoin and people use them. Mm -hmm. And I, I think people will be shocked. You're like, wow, you know, this alternate Bitcoin, this Ethereum had, you know, uh, over half the um, market cap of Bitcoin at one point. Like they'll just think that's strange, but that's the, that's where we're in today. You yeah. know? So. so when it comes to uh, securing your Bitcoin, this is something that often doesn't get talked enough about. Everyone talks about why you should buy it. And then once you buy it, people don't really think too much about securing it. They just leave it on Binance. They leave it on FTX. They leave it on uh, just an app on their phone. They might forget the password. They might forget the app name. What was the app called? I reset my phone. I don't even know the name of the app I have my Bitcoin on. You know, like they just don't really think so oh. much about securing it. So what would your suggestion be for someone who today they go out and they buy their first Bitcoin? They, they drop 38,000 bucks. They buy a Bitcoin. What should they do? Uh, well, they should just keep learning. And once they, if, if they fully get Bitcoin, then their number one goal should be figuring out self-custody. You know, self-custody is a lower priority until you fully figure out Bitcoin because you're not going to start really buying significant amounts until you figured it out. Um, once you start buying any significant amount, you should start figuring out self-custody. You know, we were looking at the mempool earlier with all the transactions. You know, this is something people don't realize is that, you know, in that 100-year period, right, we're talking about, like, most people in the future will not be doing layer one transactions. They'll be doing layer two transactions. You know, but in fact, probably... It's not guaranteed, but I think it's extremely probable that the majority of people will never do a layer one transaction. And maybe, maybe some people do a layer one transaction, right? But it's just, there's just not enough block space for, for that to happen. You know, seven transactions per second, you know, you do the math out, you know, us, you, me, the people watching, anyone that's ever done a layer one transaction, we're the weird ones, right? We're the weird left in the bell code that actually worked on layer on layer one so point of that point of saying that being that um it means that we're that you know it should be taken very seriously because because we all have a far higher number of sats than most people ever will you know most people will never be able the, the reason they won't be able to use it is because they won't be able to afford it right the fees will be too high for us the fees are fine today because we're competing against each other we're not competing against companies um, the point being that people should really take the sense they've acquired seriously because it's probably going to be far more valuable in the future than they understand. So they really should get self custody done. They really should consider multi sig vaults. They really should get their UTXOs sorted and organized and in line. That's a lower priority, but number one priority is self custody, single sig, cold storage, multi sig, cold storage, all of that, you know. And that, that, frankly, that's why I, I joined the Bitcoin Advisor for my work now is because I think that's the future. Um, you know, I, I think it's the future. I think it's where the money's going to be. I think it's where the need's going to be. Um, you know, well, way before layer two stuff develops into mass adoption, people are going to need mass adoption with multi-sig options. Um, you know, I just think that's the right progression. You know, the same way you have to have a store value before needed exchange. Because you're not exchanging any value, there's no store of value. Um, I think it's the same thing here that um, people are going to really need to think about that because if this thing rockets in price, it's going to be increasingly hard to reorient oneself in the right way in, in the speed that you want to do that, right? You know, I mean, we're recording this today, you know, a few days ago, Binance had their $4.3 billion fine. You know, maybe they can pay it, maybe they can't. I think they can pay it. I, I made a video. People called FUD asking the question, what if they couldn't pay it? I mean, I do think they'll pay it, but there's always a chance. What if they don't, right? You know, if you have your coins of Binance, if you have your coins of Coinbase, like you should consider it gone because yeah. eventually at some point it's going to go under. It's just, will it happen literally in the next week <laughs> or is it going to be 10 years? I think probably closer to 10 years, but I, I don't know that, you know, I mean, FTX, you know, last year, November 2022, um, I warned people the same thing. It's like, this thing can be around years longer or it could be gone next week. It turned out it was gone next week. Yeah. So, which I did not expect it to happen that fast, but 
I still don't lose a single sat in it because I was prepared because I knew it could happen and it happened faster than I thought. And so, you know, maybe I'm wrong to finance again. Maybe, maybe it falls apart. I doubt it will, but you never know. So yeah, self custody. They've, they've done such a good job of, of marketing themselves that you doubt that they'll go under this week. Well, well, well. The nature of a bank run is that you inherently don't know it. The, the nature of a bank run is that the critical piece of information you need to incite the bank run does not become evident until it's already starting. Right? It, it's like people think we'll have warning before it happens. It's like no, you inherently can't have warning before it happens because as soon as the warning becomes common knowledge. Then everyone's acting on that warning, which then has it begin, right? It's the same thing with FTX, right? There was smoke, 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 and then eventually the smoke got so big that boom, you know, 48 hours later, it was done, right? And the same thing with it was the same thing with Silicon Valley Bank, you know, like like you literally don't know, you know, others have said this metaphor, but I'll say it here too, is that you know, you don't know which snowflake's gonna cause the avalanche, right? And it's like by the time you know that was a snowflake that caused the avalanche. It's like, it's already started, right? It's like, it's already happening. So, you know, you, you can't prepare for it. Once it started, you can't prepare for it. It's probably too late. So yeah. the only logical thing to do is prepare for it ahead of time. But it's, most of all, which is precisely what causes it, right? So mathematically speaking, most people listening to this, they hear, oh, I should take self-custody. They put it off. Most of them, well, make out whole. So yeah. anyway. Self custody it seems like such a pain in the arse to figure out. So if people want to get set up with self custody, they can reach out to you at the Bitcoin Advisor, and you can help them get that set up squared away. Yeah, I I, I appreciate the shout out. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So so what we do at the company, we do exclusively multi sig stuff, right? So our two main groups of clients are number one, people that are brand new to self custody, scared to do it. They want someone to help them one on one. Um, help them set it up. We help those people all the time. Uh, number two are people that do understand self custody, that do have cold storage, but want some diversification, right? You have a single SIG, you have a single point of failure. So with a multi SIG, you can diversify your risk a little bit, you know, I think, and I think that's where most people will be going. So, um, so yeah, Ted, thanks for the shout out. Um, if people want to find it, I'm sure there's a link in the description or something, but. Yeah, cool. you could just go to advisor, uh, the bitcoinadvisor.com, find you there. Um, and then down there, you, uh, you get free paperwork about single sig, multi sig, a company, and then you can book a meeting with me there. But um, whatever the case, you know, obviously I have an incentive for people to become a client of mine there, a client of mine there. But my far higher incentive is just that people do it, right? That's, yeah. that's number one goal because if you don't then it goes back to binance and coinbase yep so well it, yeah it's, you either put it on exchange and it's just a matter of time or you do purely single sig self-custody in which case you're always kind of stressing about not losing your seed phrase and you're hoping your device doesn't get hacked or something but when you do multi-sig you know that that risk like you said is kind of spread out a bit so much less chance of uh, a fatal attack so. Yeah, yeah, and even if most people don't want it as the primary means of storing stats, I think it will be one that people want at least some allocation towards, right? You know, in the same way, if, if I wouldn't want all my gold in one safe, you know, I might want two or three safes, especially as it becomes valuable, right? You know, right now, one coin's not that valuable, quote unquote, you know, depending how much money one has. But, you know, in 10 years, one yeah. coin would be a lot. So, yeah. Cool. Well, Luke, thank, thank you, you so much, man. And then um, my final question I had for you is uh, do you want me to invite you to this cool community? Yeah, sure. Well, cool. I, I, don't, I don't know much about it, but <laughs> yeah, I'm always happy to check something out. It's a it's a school's a platform that allows uh, creators like yourself and like me to start their own community. And then I went and I claimed the name slash Bitcoin just like last a couple weeks ago. Right now we've got 151 members who joined purely out of interest of learning about Bitcoin. But I think uh, yeah, we made a post in there, then everyone can learn more. I'll post this video in there first to seed it for you. But um, I'll send you a link, and if you want to join, go for it completely free, and you can just educate people every time you upload a video you can also upload it there for people and they'll be stoked to see it yeah please send me information i'd love to learn about it you know my, my big 
proms time, but I, yeah. I, I, re I really, I really care about helping as many people as possible. So if, there, if the people are there, I will, yeah. I will come. So beautiful. Um, All right, Liz, take care. I really appreciate Thanks. it. This, this was a fun surprise. Yeah. Cheers, man. And then if you guys, do you guys want the same kind of deal I just did with Luke? You can go to his Patreon. Luke, uh, I'll put your Patreon, Luke, somewhere under the video if, they, if people want to book a call with you like I did. Thank you. I like what you do with your your tiers on your Patreon pricing, man. You like you showed past month and then this month and next month. And you're like, oh, I got to get it now, the best price. I love that. That, that. That's partly for my incentive to create that scarcity, oh, but also, okay. you know, more people. Like the people that were supporting me four months ago when I had, you know, half the followers or subscribers I do now or whatever. You know, they get they get to keep that price. You know, I, I didn't want to jump them up on price every month because they were one of my early supporters, right? So I love that. You know, aligning incentives, right? That's what I'm all about. So cool, thanks. man. But cheers, thanks so much for everything and keep doing what you do. I'll see you on YouTube and maybe in school. Cheers. Peace, Luke.